afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to spend some time today talking about obtaining a green card based on employment. In particular, we will talk about obtaining a green card through the PERM process. Um, a few things before we get started. Uh, the firm is a full service immigration firm, uh, but we focus on a number of different types of visas, including green cards through employer sponsorship and other types of green cards. Uh, we will continue this webinar series, doing at least two webinars a month on different topics. At the end of this webinar, we'll send out a few things. One is a, um, this PowerPoint that you'll see today. Another is a PERM guide, which is a comprehensive guide for um, this type of green card, and a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars. Uh, for the panel today, my name is Kelly Legrand Wiener. I'm the managing attorney at Scott Legal and regularly process employment based green cards. Uh, I also want to mention that um, we will have uh, some time for questions at the end. So if you have questions, please send them into the chat box and uh, we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on demand. So we will go ahead and get started. So how do you obtain a green card in the United States? Um, so two ways, um, you know, one is family-based green cards, so immediate relatives um, or preference categories. So immediate relatives are if you have a, uh, you know, uh, spouse, parents, children under 21, um, and then preference categories are for certain other family members that can be sponsored. Um, so employment-based green cards, uh, EB1 extraordinary ability. This is for a green card. This is a green card for people who can show extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics through sustained national or international acclaim, and is appropriate for people who have risen really to the very top of their field. Um, for example, if you have a one-time achievement, such as a Pulitzer Prize, an Oscar, an Olympic medal, things like that, or you can um, meet uh, a few different criteria, three criteria out of 10. Um, there's also the EB2 green card. Um, so this can uh, either be through the National Interest Waiver um, or through employer sponsorship, PERM sponsorship that we will talk more about in, um, in other slides. For the National Interest Waiver, um, you know, people that have uh, a master's degree or a higher or can demonstrate exceptional ability and can show that they merit a waiver of the job offer and labor certification process because it would be in the national interest of the United States. Uh, for the national interest waiver, you have to show that your endeavor has a substantial merit and national importance to the US, uh, that you have the ability to advance the proposed endeavor and that on balance, it would be beneficial to the US to waive the requirement of the job offer and labor certification. The EB3 green card uh, can also be, um, it's a part of a company sponsorship um, and can be obtained through the PERM that we'll talk more about in coming slides. And then additionally, other green card categories include the EB4 for um, religious workers and the EB5 uh, for investment uh, and creation of US jobs. So looking specifically at um, these employment-based green cards, um, we've talked a bit about the EB1 Extraordinary Ability and the EB2 National Interest Waiver. Additionally, uh, we offer webinars that specifically go into detail on those two, um, these two categories. We also, for the EB5, have a, um, have a webinar that specifically goes over all the requirements for EB5. So we won't go into those in detail today, but um, please look at our website and our YouTube channel both of those have uh, additional webinars that go into much greater detail about these particular employment-based green card categories. So looking at the EB2 and the EB3, um, you know, this is uh, really company sponsorship and it's, it's through something called the PERM process. Um, so this is where uh, a full-time job offer is extended um, to the foreign national by their company in the United States. And the U.S. company then must test the labor market to determine if there are any willing, qualified, and available U.S. workers. Um, if none are found, then uh, you know the, the process can proceed. So let's move to the next slide. So what is the labor certification process? Um, you know what is PERM? So PERM refers to the process where a company sponsors an applicant for a green card. 
Um, as I mentioned, the company must test the labor market um, to determine if there's any willing, qualified, and available U.S. workers. And what this means is that the company must actually place advertisements um, in various locations. And for uh, professional jobs, meaning jobs that require a bachelor's degree or higher, there are six different types of advertisements that need to be placed. For non-professional jobs, so jobs that do not require a bachelor's degree, uh, then advertisements need to be placed in three separate uh, mechanisms that are um, stipulated by regulation. So for the, for the PERM process, um, really a, a three-step process. So first is the PERM, and there are several steps to the PERM. The first being um, really coming up with the job description with the company. So the company has hired the worker, um, perhaps they already have a job description, or perhaps there's a new job. Um, so the company must look at the job and decide, um, you know, what are the job duties and then what are the requirements? And for the PERM, you have to look at what are the minimum requirements to do the job in a reasonable manner. Uh, the purpose of the PERM program from the government's perspective is that they want, um, you know, to make sure that the U.S. labor market doesn't have any U.S. workers who could perform the job. So for an employer going through this process, they must look at the job and say, okay, what's the minimum amount that we could require of a worker to do this job in a reasonable manner? Once that job description is finalized, uh, then you can go ahead and you can file for a prevailing wage determination. Uh, the prevailing wage is something that uh, you submit to the government and they'll come back and tell you based on the job location, the job duties, the job requirements, this is how much uh, you need to pay um, for the, to this worker once they have the, the green card. So the prevailing wage has to, be, has to be gathered by the company. Once that's gathered, if the wage is acceptable, uh, then you go through the recruitment process. The recruitment process is where you will actually, um, the company will actually place the advertisements. It will collect resumes, um, review them to determine if any applicants meet the requirements. If it's unclear or it's seen as they might meet the requirements, then the company must actually go ahead and interview uh, you know, those workers. And if there are any workers that do meet those minimum requirements and can't be fairly disqualified, uh, then the PERM process has to stop. Um, the company can always wait for a period of time and go back and test the labor market later. But if you do find a willing, qualified and available US worker, then the, um, the process cannot continue at that time. If the company tests the labor market and they do not find any willing, qualified and available US workers, uh, then they can proceed with the process, which involves um, preparing a form called the 9089 and submitting that to the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor will then review the process, will review the form and see if the labor certification can be certified. Um, as listed here on the PowerPoint, there are certain reasons why the Department of Labor might audit your PERM application. So if the uh, job requires a, um, a foreign language, if the job has requirements that are excessive based on what the Department of Labor thinks is normal, uh, those things can be triggers uh, for the Department of Labor to come back to the employer and say, please prove um, you know, that you've tested the labor market appropriately, Please provide all the resumes um, for all the people that you interviewed with an explanation for why they were not qualified. And really the government will look in detail at everything that was done during this first step of the process to make sure that it was done in compliance with the program. Um, so, and that audit can sometimes add several months to an adjudication of this, um, you know, this application. So if that uh, you know, is done successfully, then ultimately, um, the next step is the I-140. So once your PERM is approved, and this whole process, um, this first step of the process right now um, is taking quite a while. Um, it's taking about eight months to get a prevailing wage. Uh, the recruitment process has to be at least 60 days. Um, and then it's taking about um, you know, six to seven months for the Department of Labor to uh, approve the labor certification once it is submitted. So, um, you know, the entire process end to end could take, you know, upwards of a year based on the current processing times. Um, we certainly hope those will get better. It is possible that the Department of Labor processing times will improve. And if so, the PERM will take less time. But as of, you know, this current time in, in February 2022, these are the processing times that we're seeing. 
So once you get to the, the I-140, um, that is where the company will file um, an immigrant petition uh, with the government to say we want to sponsor this person. Uh, and with, with the I-140, the company has to include proof that they have the ability to pay the prevailing wage. Um, and they also have to include proof that the, um, the prospective employee meets all the requirements. So if the job description required um, a master's degree plus two years of experience, the I-140 submission has to show that that applicant has a master's degree and two years of experience that were earned prior to joining the company. Um, the third step of the process is the I-485, or if you're filing um, with a consulate, uh, you know, a consular processing application, and this is the actual green card application. Uh, so if you get to this step of the process where your I-140 is approved or your perm is approved um, and a green card is available to you, um, and that's based on the visa bulletin, then you can go ahead and you're in, in the United States in a valid status, then you can go ahead and you can file an I-485. So for example, if somebody is here on H-1B status and their, um, their company sponsors them for the green card, the labor certification is approved, the I-140 is approved, then if a visa is available to them, they can go ahead and file the I-485. There are backlogs for nationals um, born in certain countries, um, particularly India and China, both have backlogs for employment-based uh, categories. So for those particular applicants, um, generally, they'll not be able to immediately file the I-485. They have to wait until their priority date becomes current. Um, and then once it becomes current, if they're in the United States, they can file the I-485. If they're out of the United States or they want to process at a consulate, um, they would do something called consular processing. And just to go, um, to go back for a second um, and talk about EB-2 and EB-3, um, the EB-2 category in the company sponsorship context is available to people with either advanced degrees or the equivalent, which would mean um, a bachelor's degree plus five years of progressive post-baccalaureate experience in the field. Um, EB-3 is available to uh, professionals, so um, people who have bachelor's degrees where the job requires a bachelor's degree. Um, also available for skilled workers, meaning um, jobs that require at least two years of experience, education, or training, uh, and unskilled workers, so jobs that require less than two years of training or experience. Uh, so fin the final part of this slide would be, um, we talked about the I-485 and the you know, application being current. Um, and then the last piece of that is just family members. So if you're in the United States with your, your spouse and any um, unmarried children under 21, uh, they can apply with you on that I-485 or in your consular processing application. All right, the green card process. Um, so the green card process can be through adjustment of status or consular processing. Um, you know, as discussed in the previous slide, if you're in the United States and you're already working for an employer in a valid status uh, and your I-140 and your PERM are approved, you have that ability to adjust your status. Um, and that involves filing form I-485 with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, a nice benefit of adjusting status is that it allows you to stay in the United States until the application is, um, is ultimately adjudicated. So if you are in the United States, for example, um, let's say that you're on H-1B status again, um, and you have no ability to extend for some reason, um, you know, once you file your I-485, you still have that ability to stay in the United States based on that filing. Additionally, when you file your I-485, you can apply for work and travel authorization. Um, to allow you to travel and work freely while the application is pending. And all of your dependents can also apply for work and travel authorization along with their dependent I-485 applications. And your family can stay with you in the United States while you all wait for these applications to be adjudicated. Um, at the end of the process, uh, you know, most applicants are going to have an interview with the USCIS officer. Uh, they will, um, you know, ask questions about the, the job, the employment, to make sure that, um, you know, you're eligible, that the position is um, was still being offered and is the same position, um, you know, that was represented in the, in the application, the PERM application. 
Um, and as well, they'll make sure that you don't have any inadmissibility issues, for example, criminal issues or previous issues with violating any immigration status in the United States. So another option for some people is something called consular processing. Um, you know, there could be many reasons why people choose to do consular processing, one being if for some reason the company is sponsoring you, but you don't have an ability to stay in the United States for some reason. Um, for others, uh, they, they need to be able to travel. And once you file the I-485, um, if you're not on an H-1B or an L, you have to wait until you get travel authorization in order to travel. Uh, for some people that, you know, that doesn't work. And so they might go the consular processing route. Um, if you're going to consular process, um, once your I-140 is approved, the approval of that immigrant visa petition will be sent to the National Visa Center. Um, then the National Visa Center will get in, in contact um, and ask for fees to be paid and for the applicant to file a DS-260 um, and provide supporting documents to the National Visa Center. So these documents are all very similar to the documents that you would submit if you were filing an I-485 in the United States. So lots of biographic information, birth certificates, family, family documents. Um, and then for the consular process, you have to provide police certificates um, from any country that you've lived in um, you know, from age 16 and up. Um, so once NVC reviews the documents, um, they'll get in contact. If there's anything that they uh, have an issue with or more information that they want, they'll ask for it at that time. Uh, once they confirm they have everything that they need, then the file will be sent to, um, to the U.S. consulate uh, where you reside. And then the U.S. consulate will schedule the interview. At this point in time, uh, I'd say all consulates are quite backlogged, both with um, non-immigrant and immigrant visas because of the impact of the coronavirus. Um, however, the consulates are generally prioritizing immigrant visa cases, and we are starting to see improvements or have seen improvements over the last year, especially at certain consulates. Um, they've gotten back up and running. For example, Frankfurt is one that is, um, I'd say, largely back to pre-pandemic processing. Uh, so once you um, are scheduled for your interview with the consulate, then you will need to attend a medical appointment prior to um, your consular appointment. Um, you know, those results will get sent to the consulate. You'll attend the interview. Um, they'll ask similar questions that they would ask if you were in the United States. So um, updated documents from your employer proving that they're still offering you the same job um, that, you know, that was offered in the perm, that you're still working in the same location. And then also screening for any inadmissibility issues. Uh, if you are accepted, um, if the visa is approved, you'll hand in your passport and eventually they'll give you back, um, you know, your passport with an immigrant visa stamp in it. It's valid for usually six months. Um, and then you need to enter the United States during that time. Um, once you enter the United States, your green card will then be mailed to you uh, within usually one to two months of you entering the United States. So that is the process. Um, in terms of, you know, people often ask if one is better than the other, um, you know, whether it's better to, to adjust status or to consular process. Um, if people are already living in the United States, they'll often choose to adjust status. Um, so if that's really, if the U.S. is your primary home, um, you know, and you have the ability, you have valid underlying status, it's often a better choice uh, to do the adjustment of status because it does give you that ability to stay while you wait for the, um, you know, the process to, to go forward. And it can be quite a long process, um, can be, you know, several months or even over a year for the I-485 application to be approved. Um, if your family needs to be mobile, um, if you need to travel a lot while your green card application is pending um, and you're not on H or L status, if you don't uh, reside in the United States yet, um, then you may want to consular process. So it really depends on your particular situation and it's something that's good to discuss with your employer and your, your immigration attorney to understand which process is, is best for you. So who can pay for the, um, the green card fees? Uh, so this is a, a question that comes up quite a lot, uh, particularly if there is a foreign national who really wants their employer to sponsor them and the employer is willing, uh, you know, but not willing to pay the fees. So it is very clear um, in the law that fees related to the perm process, you know, legal fees and any other ancillary fees 
have to be paid by the sponsoring employer. The foreign national cannot pay for those fees. Um, when you get into the I-140 petition and the green card petition, the I-45 or the consular process, those may be paid by the employer or the employee. So there is some flexibility there, but there is not any flexibility in the fees related to that first part of the process, the PERM process. So people will often ask, um, you know, if I leave my employer while the green card process is pending, can they require me to repay the fees? Um, so, you know, the employer, as I said, is required to pay the PERM fees. They cannot require that you repay those fees. Um, however, uh, for the I-140, the I-485 fees, or if the company paid for any dependent fees, um, it's not, you know, it's not um, required that the employer pay. So if they did pay for it, um, you know, it may be that there was some agreement between you that requires you to repay those fees. So, um, you know, that is something where you may need to repay, depending on what the agreement was with your employer. All right. So dual intent, um, you know, dual intent is a concept uh, that you can be in the U.S. on a temporary visa, for example, an H-1B visa, and it is still permitted that you apply for a permanent visa, meaning a green card, um, to stay here uh, permanently. There are single intent visas, um, for example, a TN visa or an F-1 student visa. These are temporary visas where you have to show that you do not intend to move permanently to the U.S. You have to show that um, you, know, you have a residence abroad that you don't intend to abandon. Um, so many non-immigrant visas do not allow for dual intent. Really, um, you know, as mentioned on this slide, the H-1B um, and the L are both clearly dual intent visas. Uh, the O and to a certain extent, even the E um, are more kind of quasi dual intent visas um, where it's, it's a bit more flexible. There's language in the regulations in the foreign affairs manual that suggests that you don't really, uh, you don't need to prove that you have a, a residence abroad that you don't intend to abandon, but they're not quite as forgiving as the H-1B and the L visas that are explicitly dual intent um, visas. And so, you know, for an H-1B or um, an L visa holder, once they have a green card petition that's pending, there's a lot more flexibility for them. They're able to travel back and forth um, internationally without it being an issue. Um, whereas for others, for example, um, if you're here on the E-visa, um, if you file an adjustment of status application, you cannot depart the United States and re-enter on your E-2 visa. That would abandon your green card application. Um, so it's, uh, you know, to the extent that you are filing for your green card application and you're not on, um, you know, an H-1B visa or an L visa, you do want to work closely with Immigration Council, both to figure out um, what is the strategy for maintaining um, your underlying status and do you have any restrictions on travel? Because once that green card application is filed, if it's filed as an adjustment of status and you're not on H-1B or L, you cannot travel until you get your travel authorization uh, granted. Um, so one question that comes up a lot is whether you can still apply for a green card if you're in the US on a visa that doesn't allow for dual intent. And the answer is yes, um, intent can change over time. So for example, if you're on a TN visa, um, you know, you may have gone to the border as a Canadian to get your TN granted. And at that time, your intent was temporary. You intended to come in and temporarily work for this company. However, perhaps the next year, your company, um, you know, mentions that they may be willing to sponsor you for a green card. And now your intent has changed. And so they start going through the green card process. So there's nothing wrong with that. It is certainly possible to apply for um, you know, the green card while on a non-dual intent visa, but you do need to think about it more carefully. Um, and, and the timing of when you file each part of the application, um, you know, should be discussed more, um, you know, more in depth. Additionally, intent is assessed at each entry. Um, so for example, you would not want to enter one day on your TN and then file a green card application the next day, um, you know, because that would be, the, the time would be too short. You would want to perhaps wait for a few um, weeks or months, um, you know, so that it wasn't, uh, you know, so it's not, an, it doesn't become an issue of whether or not you misrepresented your intent at the border. So considerations um, from moving uh, from a visa to a green card. 
So you want to look at uh, you know, timing and underlying visa status. Consider how much time is left on your current underlying visa. Um, it's a, uh, you know, a good idea to have the conversation with your employer um, earlier rather than later. So for example, if you're on an H-1B visa and perhaps you've used up three years of your time, um, you really wanna start having this conversation with your employer. Or if you um, are at a company that's uh, sponsoring you for the green card, but you wanna move to another company, you wanna have that conversation with them um, as to whether or not they're willing to sponsor you. Um, you know, For example, the H-1B, you can only get that for up to six years. So if you haven't started your green card process, um, you know, by that sixth year, then, you know, you're in a situation where you may need to leave the United States. Um, you know, you may need to apply to be in the lottery again. You may need to look for another visa type that's maybe appropriate for you. So you want to plan um, early to the extent that you can. Um, additionally, um, you want to think about what type of visa you're on and whether or not um, there's going to be an ability to extend it once you've gotten to certain, uh, certain point of the green card process. So for example, with the TN visa, um, you know, you're not going to be able to extend the TN visa once, uh, you know, it's going to be very difficult to extend a TN visa once you have an approved immigrant petition, um, such as an I-140. Uh, that's, it, it's, you, you could file um, file the I-140, you know, saying you're going to consular process and that might help. Um, but, it, it, you know, it, it's something where when you go to the border and they're asking about your, whether you have immigrant intent, it's going to be very difficult to, um, you know, to say that you really don't have immigrant intent if you're, you know, at a certain stage of the green card process. Um, so another thing to consider is, do you want to adjust status or get your green card through consular processing? Um, you know, when you're going, if you are uncertain and you think you may want to consular process, it's a good idea on your I-140 to check consular processing. Um, that is because if you, uh, if you decide you just want to adjust status in the U.S., it's an easy fix to just file your form I-485. Um, however, if you decide, no, I don't want to adjust status, I want to go to a consulate, it can actually be um, more logistically difficult to get the approval sent to the National Visa Center if you don't check consular processing in your I-140. So um, that's definitely something to, to think about. Um, another thing to consider is your family. So do you have children that you also want to obtain the green card with you? Um, if that's the case, you may want to consider, you know, filing early to avoid any issues with your children aging out, which they will do, um, you know, it, once they turn 21, uh, it becomes more complicated, you know, it's, it's not possible to sponsor uh, in certain circumstances. All right, so looking at, um, you know, green card um, interview considerations. So once you've gotten to this stage, you know, you've gotten through the PERM process, uh, you know, you've gotten through the I-140 approval, the I-485, you know, or consular process petition with all your biographic, and background information has, has been reviewed and now you're finally at the stage of the interview. So before your interview, you really want to review your visa petition, review your green card petition. Um, you know, the visa petition, the I-140 petition is going to have information about the job offer, information about the company and the work that you'll be doing in the US. The green card petition, the I-485, that's going to have biographic information, information about your immigration history, your criminal history, um, and, and just your, um, you know, your history in the United States. Um, so you want to review both of those to make sure you're familiar with all of your responses, particularly if there are any red flags, if you've ever had times you've been out of status, if there were any criminal issues, all those things you want to make sure that you're familiar with and have discussed any issues with your attorney as to how to address those problems at the interview. Um, it's a good idea to organize and print all your documents, bring them in a binder, have them easily accessible for you. You will also be required to bring some original documents. So birth certificates, marriage certificates. Um, you should bring originals of those with you um, at, along with copies to the interview. Additionally, um, you should bring your sealed medical exam if that wasn't sent in advance. So that's on form I-693. Um, they, they don't expire now for two years from when they're done. So, um, but you do wanna make sure if you got it done early um, that it hasn't expired. Uh, you should also bring updated proof of employment from your sponsoring employers. So um, you want to bring kind of a, a job, a current job offer letter showing that the, the job is the same. Um, you could bring pay stubs. Um, 
if you are not working for the company at that current point in time, um, you want to be able to explain how you're supporting yourself. Um, you know, like if you're on, let's say you, you're on a student visa and you never went to H-1B and your STEM OPT authorizations expired and you've just been living off of savings, uh, you know, you should be prepared to explain what it is you've been doing to show you've been maintaining, you know, whatever status it is that you're on. Um, and then you will also want to meet with your attorney and do a practice interview uh, where they can kind of ask you questions uh, and just get kind of comfortable discussing uh, the details of the job as well as the details of, of your history and, and what's on the I-485. Um, it's also a good idea, uh, you know, if you're going with a spouse and your children, um, for your spouse, it's a good idea to bring proof of validity of the marriage. Um, you know, so, you know, for example, photos, um, you know, you'll have the birth certificates of your children, you know, if you have any um, evidence of kind of uh, that you live together, so documents for your mortgage, um, or a joint lease agreement, perhaps a joint bank statement to help show the validity of, of that relationship for the, the green card application. All right, so let's talk about you know, porting um, and changing employers during the green card process. Uh, so porting allows employees to change employers once the I-485 application has been pending for at least 180 days. Um, the I-140 uh, has to have been approved before a porting request can be approved. Um, but the benefit um, of, of porting once the I-485 has been pending for 180 days is that your new employer does not have to complete that um, perm part of the process. So the entire labor market test, uh, the employer does not have to, to actually go through. Um, the new employment must be in the same or a similar occupational classification uh, as the job offered in the other um, in the form I-140 that is the basis of your green card petition. Um, so to establish that a new position is in the same or a similar occupational classification, um, you can submit evidence, for example, regarding the Department of Labor occupational code assigned to the job. Um, you want to include information about the job duties, the skills, experience, um, what education is required, are there any licenses or certifications that are similar, um, what are the wages offered for each job, um, and really any other credible, relevant evidence to show that, um, you know, the I-140 position or the job that was approved in the I-140 and the new position that, you know, you'll be porting to um, really are, are similar. Uh, if you are arguing that it's the same job, then USCIS will determine if the jobs are identical. Um, more often, you're going to be arguing it's a similar job, and that's where they'll be looking at and comparing, you know, the job duties, the job requirements, the job skills, the wages, um, and uh, so anything that you can have from the company that can help show this is, you know, a, a similar job, uh, you know, is helpful. Uh, so, you know, some people ask, what if the job with your current employer has changed from what was in the perm? Uh, and that can happen because it can take, you know, a few years for the, the perm to get approved. So, um, you know, if the job with your current employer has changed, you can um, also use this porting uh, benefit to, uh, you know, to get a green card, you know, the same, under the same requirements, the I-485 has to have been pending for 180 days, and the job has to be in a same or similar classification. Um, when you are porting, uh, you notify USCIS by filing form I-485 supplement J uh, with details of the new uh, permanent job offer. And, um, Unfortunately, if you do request to port and USCIS denies the application, um, you know, they will use Supplement J as the basis of determining whether you're eligible for a green card. Um, therefore, if that is denied, then the entire green card application is denied and you would need to start over with any new uh, green card application. So can I change employers after I get my green card? Um, you know, when you obtain your employment-based green card, both you and the company are making a good faith attestation that you intend to continue working for them, uh, you know, full time. So uh, ultimately, yes, uh, you can change employers. There's nothing that stops you from changing employers in the future. People rarely these days stay at one company for their entire career. That being said, if you obtain your green card and a week later you change your job, 
um, that is something that might raise some red flags. And where that would come up is during the naturalization process. So when you go to become a US citizen in the future, um, they'll look back to see how did you obtain your green card? And if they see that employment history and they see, well, you got your green card and that, you know, for company A, and then a week later you handed in your notice and you went and worked for company B, it's something they could ask about um, just to determine that at the time that you were, um, you know, going to your green card interview that you didn't make any misrepresentations. So uh, yes, it's possible to change employers. Many people do it without issue. Um, but if you're going to be doing it right after you get your green card, it's something that you want to be aware of. Um, that, that could potentially be an issue at the naturalization stage. All right, so, um, so now we have a, a few questions that came in um, that we'll take a look at. Uh, so one person asked, um, if my E2 visa is expired, do I have to file, file a renewal before the EB2 application is filed? Um, what are the risks? So uh, I'd say that once you are, um, it depends on what part of the EB2 application. So the, uh, the first part of the EB2 application, the, the PERM, um, that's just a company petition. Nothing is being filed, uh, you know, kind of for the applicant at that point. Um, so it's, it's not an issue. Like if you have an ongoing PERM um, and your E2 visa is expired, uh, you know, it's a good idea to renew um, before you get to the point where you're filing an I-140. So um, if, uh, if you don't file, um, if you don't file to renew your E2 before your I-140 is, is filed, it's still possible to try to renew the E2, but you're gonna have a, a harder time um, successfully arguing that you have non-immigrant intent because you will have had an actual immigrant petition um, that's been filed and that does have to be disclosed on the DS-160 um, for your E2 application. Um, so someone asked, what is the pathway for someone having a non-immigrant visa like E3 to a green card? Um, so there, there is no kind of direct pathway between any non-immigrant visa and a green card. Um, what, what happens is if you are in the U.S. on a non-immigrant visa and there is a green card category available to you, you can file for it. So for example, if you're on a non-immigrant visa like an E3, an E3 is available to Australians um, for jobs that are specialty occupations, meaning jobs that require bachelor's degrees. So often you'll be working for a company in the United States on your E3. If there's, uh, if the company wants to sponsor you for the visa, I mean, for the, e, uh, for the green card, then they could go ahead and um, start that firm process we talked about, test the US labor market, and then go through the I-140 and the I-485 for you uh, while you're here on your E3. Um, Someone's asking if a U.S. bachelor's degree is mandatory for the green card application or if you can use a foreign degree that is equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's degree. Um, does a foreign degree qualify for EB2, EB3? So yes, you can use foreign degrees. Um, the foreign degree does have to be evaluated as equivalent to, to a U.S. degree. Um, and it's um, uh, like, so for example, if you have a degree and it's a three-year degree, that's often not going to be considered equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's degree. So it's still possible um, to, to proceed with an EB3 category, um, but if you, you know, but maybe not with an EB2 category. Uh, so it is a good idea to get your, um, your, if you have a foreign degree, it's possible to still be sponsored for a green card, but you will need to get your degree evaluated. And depending on um, if it's a three-year degree, a four-year degree, um, and what the equivalency is found to be, um, that may impact whether you qualify for an EB2 or an EB3. Um, Someone's asking how long it will take for a Canadian citizen working on a TN to get a green card. Um, so it's, I'd say that if, it, if you're talking about going through the, um, the PERM process, uh, you know, once your employer starts sponsoring you, as we discussed, the PERM process right now, based on current processing times, is taking about, um, you know, a year, year and a half. Um, and then uh, the I-140, uh, it's taking several months to be processed, but you can do something called premium processing where you pay $2,500 to the government to get uh, um, a response in 15 calendar days. Um, so you can do that part faster and then you can go ahead and file your, your green card application. So um, to come in on the TN to get the green card, I think um, you know right now general processing times are probably a year and a half to three years to actually have that green card physically in your hand. 
Um, but it's, uh, you know, that that's for everyone, not just for anyone on a TN, but that's, that's kind of the general process. Uh, someone's asking if I file an ETH to, to renewal and then I file the LN40, is there a risk the two applications get canceled because of dual intent? Um, so what the risk, if you file an E2 renewal um, and then you have an I-140 that's also pending or approved, um, they, they don't get canceled, but the, the risk is that when you go to your E2 interview, like let's say you're going to a consulate, um, you have to submit something called a DS-160 and you answer a question about whether or not you have an immigrant petition that was submitted on your behalf. Because you would answer yes, they might say to you, well, what are your future plans? Do you plan to be in the United States permanently? And if they find that you do, um, then you know, the E2 may not be granted. Um, so they don't cancel one another out. Um, you know, both could hypothetically still be approved. For example, you could have your I-140 filed and, note, and say that you don't plan to adjust status in the U.S., you plan to do consular processing, and it could be the case, it is often the case for people that they are not 100% sure of their future plans. So someone on an E2 could say, right now my plan is, you know, my intent is temporary, I intend to come run this company. Um, I have this other I-140 option open for me. I'm, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be doing with it yet, but I plan to come to a process and that may be approvable. Um, uh, so once the I-140 is approved and submitted, um, I-485 with permit to work, is it possible to continue working even if your visa expired after you submitted your I-485? So um, I, I think what they're asking here is, is it possible to, uh, if you're in the United States, and your visa has expired, but you um, timely filed an I-485, and you timely filed for work authorization, once you get that work authorization card, yes, you could start to work based on the valid work authorization card. Um, for, uh, does it make any difference in wait time if one goes for an employer-sponsored green card or family-sponsored, family-relative-sponsored green card? Um, it, it does, it can make a difference. Um, it, it's really based on the visa bulletin, which is more technical than we're going to go into today. But yes, it's a good idea if you have both options available to you, family-sponsored green card or employer-sponsored green card, it's a good idea to discuss with the immigration attorney as to um, you know, what is available to you because there are long wait times kind of in all categories, but um, the categories some have shorter wait times, so it's worth um, investigating. Uh, can I go for a TN extension during my green card process? Uh, so you can at various times. So let's say that the perm is still pending, the company is still testing the labor market. You can still um, you know, go for your TN extension during that time. Once an I-140 is filed, it's gonna be much more difficult. And once an I-485 is filed, uh, no, you, can, you cannot extend your TN at that point. Um, if you have a valid E2 visa, would I still be able to travel once I file the perm? Um, so for the PERM, yes, the PERM is, is a company petition. Um, it's not, uh, nothing is filed in your particular name. Nothing has to be disclosed, uh, you know, when the PERM is filed. Uh, so you can still travel on your valid E2 visa once the PERM is filed. If an I-485 is filed, then you cannot travel on the E2 visa uh, anymore. Perfect, so I think that is all the questions that we have. I appreciate everyone. Um, spending their time today learning about the employment-based green cards. As I mentioned, this recording will be available and we will be sending out um, this PowerPoint as well as a comprehensive guide. Uh, thank you for your time and I wish you all a, a, a great day.